This morning's Bible reading uh, is Exodus 32, which is on uh, page 70 of the Church Bible. That's not going to work. I'll give you a moment to flip to that. Chapter 32. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing, and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterwards, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I have commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. But Moses sought favour of the Lord, his God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought up out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, It was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and wipe them off the face of the earth. Turn from your fierce anger, relent, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them and it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. Moses turned and went down the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands. They are inscribed on both sides, front and back. The tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. When Joshua heard the the noise of the people shouting, he said to Moses, There is the sound of war in the camp. Moses replied, It is not the sound of victory. It is the sound of defeat. It is the sound of singing that I hear. When Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them into pieces at the foot of the mountain. As he took the calf the people had made and burnt it in the fire, then he ground it into powder, scattered it on the water, and made the Israelites drink it. He said to Aaron, What did these people do to you that you led them into such great sin? Do not be angry, my lord, Aaron answered. You know how prone these people are to evil. They said to me, Make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So I told them, whoever has any gold jewellery, take it off. Then they gave me the gold, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. Moses saw that the people were running wild, and that Aaron had let, let them get out of control, and so became a laughing stock to their enemies. So he stood at the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the Levites rallied to him. Then he said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Each man strap a sword to his side. Go back and forth through the camp, from one end to the other. 
each killing his brother and friend and neighbour. The Levites did as Moses commanded, and that day about 3,000 of the people died. Then Moses said, You have been set apart to the Lord today, for you were against your own sons and brothers, and he has blessed you this day. The next day Moses said to the people, You have committed a great sin, but now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses went back to the Lord and said, Oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold. But now, please forgive their sins. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. The Lord replied to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Now go, lead the people to the place I spoke of, and my angel will go before you. However, when the time comes for me to punish, I will punish them for their sin. And the Lord struck the people with a plague because of what they did with the calf Aaron had made. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Will. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Tom Pountain, the minister here at Rossville Anglican Church. It's great to be uh, here with you today to open up this part of God's word together. Uh, let me pray for us all before um, we do that. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this portion of scripture that you have uh, given us by which you have revealed yourself to us. Pray that you would help us this morning to understand who you are better and that we might know ourselves better. Uh, in the reflection of who you truly are. And please help us to correct those that wrong thinking in our minds, in our hearts, um, shaped not by your word, but by the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, have you ever noticed how, how weird it is that we live in a world uh, in which rejection of God is so normal? Uh, you probably haven't. You probably, because we've grown up in a world which is long used to rejecting God, we think that's the default position, don't we? Uh, we think it's the default position that most people in the world um, don't worship God. They don't recognise Jesus as Lord. Uh, not only that, they blaspheme him. Um, they worship other gods in his place. Um, they give their lives to other pursuits. We think that's kind of normal. But how could it possibly be normal that the one who created the universe is so disrespected by his creatures? Have you ever noticed how odd it is that on that first Christmas when God himself became flesh and came to his own people as light in the darkness, he was not received as the king of kings, but he was rejected and killed. It's weird. That's an understatement, isn't it? It's awful. It's bizarre. Yet not only has the world grown old in its rebellion, uh, we've become very used to it as well. Uh, we expect people to reject God. But it's a sign that something has gone horribly, horribly wrong with our world. Um, not only since the beginning of creation uh, and the wonderful picture of Eden where uh, humanity and God walk together, um, but even from Exodus. Um, do you notice that in the video we watched earlier, if you've been with us for the last few weeks? And um, we see that God um, made Israel, made his people his special treasured possession. He had a very special relationship with his people. He treasured them. Uh, he revealed himself to his people perfectly through his law um, he even ate with them we saw last week um, he uh, made a covenant relationship that was meant to endure uh, people could even see him and um, whereas now people seem um, so distant from him that we don't think we can even begin to know him properly and in this bit of the bible we've gone from that special relationship between god and his people um, to the end of this chapter where god ends up uh, killing 3,000 of them, and then um, sending a plague. Um, that's not a, good, not a good start to that relationship, is it? Who, do, who does God normally send plagues against in Exodus? Anyone know? Enemies, Pharaoh, Egypt. And yet in the space of one, a few chapters, Israel has gone from being his treasured possession to being like Pharaoh, like Egypt on the outside. Um, so what has gone wrong? Uh, well, the problem isn't with God. That's what most people think. Isn't it the problem thing that people reject God today because he's far off or unknown or doing something wrong? But we see here that the problem between the broken relationship between humanity 
and their God is with us. Uh, we are the ones who broke the covenant. Uh, we failed the relationship and the consequences are catastrophic. Uh, in three weeks' time, we're going to have a, a look at the tabernacle, which is kind of where most of the last few, uh, second half of Exodus uh, is based. Uh, and we'll see that actually God does end up dwelling with his people. Next week, we're going to see, um, David's going to show us uh, what turned around, what God did to turn that situation around. And actually, if you come back in two weeks' time, uh, there'll be some good news there as well, because that's Christmas. Um, but for now, today, we're going to focus on the bad news. Uh, what did we do? to break this relationship and what are the effects? Uh, what causes such a big failure? Uh, we're going to spend most of our time in the first point, the first six verses of that chapter, um, the failed covenant. Um, so verse one, uh, when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, uh, they gathered around Aaron and said, come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, who brought us up out from Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. Um, so all the while, while Moses is uh, speaking to God, um, uh, very quickly things go wrong. Do you notice that they, the people desire gods to go up before them? Um, their concern uh, is for their future security. Uh, remember where they are at this point, God has miraculously brought them out of slavery in Egypt and through the Red Sea into the wilderness, but there's still a long way to go before they get to the promised land. Uh, despite everything that God has done for them, they're still not quite sure he's up to the job of finishing um, what he promised them. Um, they're looking to the future with uncertainty, um, but they've also forgotten so much about their past, haven't they? And they've forgotten the huge lengths that God has gone to to rescue them. And the miracles that he was able to perform, and the plagues he sent to defeat their enemies, and the Passover by which uh, he gave them freedom, his parting of the Red Sea to lead them out, his provision of water from the rock, uh, manna and quails, how he led them through pillars of cloud and fire, how he gave them uh, his words on the mountain. So many wonderful things that God has done for his people, yet they have forgotten them all. Um, not only that, but in chapter 24, last week we saw that they committed themselves to full obedience to all of the law. Uh, and yet very quickly they failed, including, of course, and do you remember those first two commands, not to make any other God, not put any other gods before God and not make any other idols. Um, they've seen God in some sense, at least some of them have. And the reason that Moses has been away for so long, which has caused them such, such distress now, is that God is kind of laying down the foundations for this new relationship. Uh, he's giving the law, he's explaining how he can dwell with them as his people. Um, a wonderful privilege that they were about to receive. And that's why Moses has been gone for 40 days. And yet, as they wait for this relationship, perfect relationship with God to be established, they begin looking elsewhere. Uh, you could say that the ink is still drying on the marriage certificate, and they go off and have an affair with someone else. Uh, in fact, while their, other, uh, their new marriage uh, partner is off kind of um, doing the paperwork to seal the deal, and so do you see how from this moment the covenant is broken? Uh, God's people assume a new relationship with God that endures. Evermore they become the prodigal son. On the run from God they become the adulterous uh, wife. And they have turned away from God and looked elsewhere. They've rejected God already in verse 1. And then in verses 2 to 4 uh, they replace him. Uh, Aaron answered them, take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. Uh, so all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. Uh, he took what they handed him and made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Uh, then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Uh, it no, should be no surprise um, that after breaking the first uh, commandment of trying to put something else uh, in front of God, they also break the second commandment and make uh, images. Now, what on earth are they doing here? Why do they make um, this, this calf idol? Uh, well, it could be that the, the, the bulls were worshipped um, by many of the nations around them at the time. It was linked to the, to the god Baal, if you know the name Baal from elsewhere in the Bible. And bulls were a sign of strength and fertility. 
um, for some of the pagan nations. And perhaps they wanted some of that strength. And they knew that they were going to be in danger uh, as they made their way to the promised land from some of their other uh, enemy nations. They thought, well, let's get a bit of their own strength and use it against them. Let's get some of their powerful bull god fertility. But, of course, they've forgotten just how much power they had uh, on their side. And they had the mighty Lord, who's on all these amazing works that we've just um, talked about. And they rejected him, and they replaced him uh, with a grass-munching baby cow. Uh, who would you rather trust um, to defeat your enemies? It sounds ridiculous, doesn't it, um, to us? But for them, they genuinely made the choice um, to worship this calf. Uh, why? Presumably because, as ridiculous as it looks like to us, to them it did have some plausibility. And actually, this was the thing that the nations around them were worshipping. And um, there might be things that we likewise worship today that might look ridiculous to them. Um, but actually, but because the world around us um, gives so much credence to them, uh, we find it much more plausible to worship these other idols. Uh, notice initially, they only wanted this God to help them in the future. Um, but soon it encroaches on all the space that should be taken by the Lord God. Uh, Aaron says at the, at the end of the verse, and these are your gods who brought you up out of Egypt. Not only are these the ones who are going to save them in the future, now apparently they're the ones that were with them all along. And notice how, how wholeheartedly they serve this new god and so quickly. Uh, immediately they take off all their gold earrings uh, of their wives, their sons, their daughters, and all uh, give them away very willingly. It seems a very little uh, lead up. Aaron didn't have to do a kind of big pledge month or kind of talk for uh, weeks in advance to encourage people to give some of their gold for this new calf project and think about how best they can do that. They just were tearing the earrings and tearing all the jewelry off and chucking them in the fire. Uh, they were desperate. Notice it was all of the people doing this. Uh, all the people gave all they had for service of this new so-called God. In fact, not only was the gold kind of theirs, the gold uh, we see elsewhere in these chapters was, was primarily meant to be used for this tabernacle. Uh, it's meant to be used for worship of the Lord, um, the instructions for which God was giving Moses at the very time that they were making this idol. <clears throat> and the people were giving their all, and notice that Aaron himself uh, was entirely committed to this project in verse 4. Um, I've never made a gold calf. I don't suppose any of you have as well. I've never made anything out of gold, and I don't think I've ever fashioned a calf out of any um, uh, product. But I imagine it would be quite hard work, don't you think? Um, he uh, noticed the lengths that Aaron went to. Um, he took all this gold, and he made it into an idol in the shape of a calf. He fashioned it with a tool. Uh, now, that's a brief account, but imagine it was a huge amount of work, particularly um, for them at the time. How much time and effort would it take to make a calf? It just shows up just how ridiculous his later claim was that we've already laughed about in verse 24, that it just came out of a fire uh, when he threw it in. Um, no, it was slow, uh, painstaking, deliberate effort on the part of Aaron and God's people to make this idol. They rejected God and they have sought to replace him. And so the consequence then is rebellion in verses five to six. Uh, when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. Um, so the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. <clears throat> um, Notice all the while as this is going on, they're trying to keep some kind of religious um, veneer, uh, it seems, but ultimately it leads to all kinds of wickedness and rebellion. And that final uh, line, when it says they got up to indulge in revelry, uh, it's a Bible translator's polite way of saying something that was probably more like gross um, sexual immorality. <clears throat> um, they were claiming this would be a festival um, to the Lord, um, but instead, it was a disgusting party that went on all the way until Moses made his way down the mountain in verse 19. They were still partying. In fact, 25, verse 25 says the people were running wild. They were out of control. A laughing stock even to their enemies, even worse than those surrounding uh, nations. <clears throat> 
um, pretending to worship God, pretending to be religious, um, using God's covenant name, the name that God gave them, uh, the name of the Lord, to be in relationship with them. This was meant to be a festival to the Lord, um, but instead it was the worst kind of sin, the worst kind of rebellion. In rejecting God and replacing God, uh, they've gone completely off the rails. Uh, it's often said that this is a kind of big example of the sin of idolatry, breaking, um, I guess, the first and second commandment. But really, um, almost all of the commandments, I think, are broken in this episode. Uh, almost uh, all of them uh, got the entire basis, the Ten Commandments of this new covenant has been effectively shattered. It seems like a very early low point in the history of God's people. Um, but in fact, this just becomes the default setting for God's people ever since. Uh, it's still true of us today, isn't it, in this world? We live in a world in which, by and large, tragically, the default is a broken relationship with God. Now, you might not know many people. You might never felt that temptation to kind of melt down your jewellery and make a metal cow. Uh, if you've had friends who have stopped being Christian, um, they probably haven't gone off to worship Zeus or Ra. Um, but because all of us, um, just like they did then, we, had, we make gods in our own image and in the image of the world around us. Uh, Calvin said that our hearts are perpetual factories of idols. Um, we always make idols all the time and they come from us. And so they look a bit like us or who we might want to be. And we're, it seems we're a bit more comfortable with the idea of a God who just looks a bit more like us, who's a bit more palatable, who won't demand things of us that we don't want demanded, that maybe looks a bit more respectable to people around us and because that's what they worship as well or a bit more like them. Um, but they fall far short and offer so little. <clears throat> uh, here's one um, definition of an idol um, from the Heidelberg uh, Catechism, if uh, this helps you grasp it. It is something invented uh, in which to put our trust uh, instead of or in addition to the true and living God. Uh, we invent something or use something which already exists um, to put our trust in instead of or in addition to the true and living God. You see, um, God's people here, they replaced God very much, um, but there was some sense in which they tried to add this worship onto the Lord. They still use the veneer of religion. And this is a problem for God's people here, right? This is not merely the problem of the world around us. This is how God's people ate the world around them. And they go through the motions of religion uh, day by day, week by week, um, but their heart and their treasures are given elsewhere. It maybe speaks of the person today who will go through the motions, they'll kind of turn up to church, they'll do their bit, um, but their heart goes somewhere else, Monday to Friday, given over to treasures, Saturday given somewhere else, whether it's your job, your family, your friends, your schooling, um, your leisure, your property, or just your pursuit of cash. Uh, ultimately, something else is added to or replaced to your worship of the Lord. This is the default for us all, and it's awful and it's tragic. Uh, we've turned our back on the true and living God, um, the one who saves his people, and have gone horribly off track. Uh, so then, uh, more briefly, we'll see four of the implications in the rest of this chapter that show just what a big deal and um, just how catastrophic this broken covenant is. Uh, firstly, we see a failed intercession from Moses. And Moses um, sees how bad the situation is. Um, God tells him that, he's going, that God is angry at their sin and is so, and so is going to destroy him. And this might sound odd to you that it's a failed intercession because it seems a successful one because Moses pleads with him and then God says uh, that he will uh, relent in verse 14. Verse 14, the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. And that sounds like a good thing, because verse 10, he said he's angry and he's going to destroy them. Um, but as good as that is, relenting, it falls far short uh, after that moment of what God had promised them. Uh, notice, uh, if you turn down to chapter 33, which we haven't uh, read, um, God still said he will um, give them the promised land that they wanted to go to. In fact, even back in 32 verse 10, he still says he was going to make them into a great nation. Um, but something has changed in chapter 33. Um, 
the reason that they're so sad, they're so distressed in verse 4, uh, is because he's no longer going to go with them. <clears throat> uh, if I were to go with you for even a moment, verse 5, I might destroy you. You see, God has relented of his anger. He's still going to let them go to the promised land. But it's his relationship with them which is enduringly broken. And that's what's so catastrophic for his people. Um, his anger remains. The intercession hasn't really worked. Um, he always said he was going to make them a great nation. But the problem is that his relationship with them is totally changed. Moses' intercession, his pleading with the Lord, uh, might have bought them a bit of time, as it were. It might have avoided the worst of destruction. Um, but he's no longer going to go with them, he says. Um, it has ultimately failed. And so after that, we see uh, a failed revelation, or that is the failed um, law. When Moses comes down uh, the mountain in verse 15, he has with him these two tablets of the law. Um, the Ten Commandments written on uh, stone tablets, meant to be enduring and long-lasting. Stone was about as durable as you, you could get in the time. Uh, meant to be um, the sign of this uh, long-lasting um, relationship. Um, but what does Moses do uh, to them in verse 19? He throws them down and breaking them into pieces. Um, the this, this sign, the bedrock of their relationship is broken. Uh, not just because Moses threw them down, but all Moses has done here is reflected back to God's people what they have done. And they have cast aside God's law. They've broken pretty much all of the commandments. And they've turned their back on God. And so Moses is symbolically breaking that uh, bedrock of the covenant relationship. Um, God always knew that God's people would fail and sin. Um, and so as well as the law, um, the, the priesthood was meant to be one of the safeguards against sin. And they were meant to make themselves holy, um, go into the tabernacle, make sacrifices, purify God's people. Um, but we see here that even um, Aaron, God's high priest, has completely failed himself in his task of being high priest. And um, we've already seen quite a bit of that, haven't we? How he was actually kind of leading uh, Israel in making this idol uh, we saw in verse 24 how he kind of blamed uh, the fire for making the idol. Uh, in verse 21, when Moses ac accuses him, uh, in verse 22, sorry, he says how, how prone these people are to evil, uh, as if they kind of bend his arm and, and made him. Uh, he's meant to be the leader of God's people. He's meant to be the holy high priest. Um, but instead, he can only be uh, defensive and lie and blame others as to his own failure. Uh, even the priesthood has failed. And then finally, even Moses' attempt at atonement uh, fails. Um, he sees how catastrophic, Moses, the effects are for God's people. Um, he sees that um, the wages of sin are death. And so rightly, death is coming upon God's people. Um, he doesn't uh, question that. But in verse 30, he says, you have committed a great sin. Um, judgment is deserved. Um, but if I go up to the Lord, perhaps I can make atonement for your sin and so he knows that sin um, demands death. It demands a blood sacrifice. Uh, verse 32 says, please forgive their sin, uh, even if it means blotting me out of the book, even if it means my own death. Um, he wants to die as a, a substitute, um, but God says no. It's whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. We know that includes uh, Moses. I will punish them for their sin. <clears throat> so do you see here a catastrophic failure at the beginning of this chapter and all the way through signs of just how big a problem it is that all these failures of all the safeguards of their relationship with God has fallen down uh, do you see just how serious sin is how serious breaking God's commandments how serious the sin of idolatry is uh, we often don't because we live in a world that thinks it normal and um, sadly we are in a wider church that so often soft pedals sin and thinks that it can be normal. Um, that just like God's people did here, looks at the world and tries to make God in its own image, uh, make a God that is palatable and can be uh, acceptable in the eyes of the world. Uh, we can take God for granted, can't we? Uh, we can underestimate the power and danger of our own sin. Uh, we can forget the privilege of knowing God. We can forget all the things that God has done for us to save us, to bring us this far. 
Uh, we think it's normal to be an unbeliever in this world, to reject God, to not know Jesus as Lord, um, but there's nothing normal about it. Um, you're on the wrong side of the God who hates sin. He hates sin so much that he rightly wanted to punish his people when they committed it. He hates sin so much that he didn't stop there, um, but as we'll see uh, next week, uh, his uh, well, I won't spoil it, but we'll come back next week and see what God did to turn the situation around. And the week after that, well, it's Christmas, and then we'll see um, the lens to which God went to turn our situation around. Um, not content to leave us in our sin, not content to leave us rightly on the receiving end of his judgment. Um, he sent the only one into the world, uh, made flesh, uh, who could perfectly reveal uh, himself to the world in a way that even the Ten Commandments couldn't. One who could be a perfect high priest, and because unlike Aaron, he was without sin, who would not lead his people into sin, but always be holy. Uh, one who would intercede um, perfectly, unlike Moses, to the Father on our behalf, and because enduringly he now sits at the right hand of the Father, uh, having made an atonement for sin uh, by his own death on a cross, uh, thanks to a perfect life, offering a perfect sacrifice, um, shedding his own blood to establish a new covenant, a perfect covenant, uh, written in his own blood, a one that means for his people we can endure in relationship with God for eternity. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for this reminder of the gravity of our sin. We do pray that we would be uh, appalled at the way we see God's people fall so far short of your good standards. Um, but we're horrified how we see that same um, propensity to disobey you, to reject you, to create idols in our own heart as well. And we do ask that we would be those who, who repent of our own tendency to reject you. We know that as Christians, so often we can do that, and we uh, pray for those who don't yet know you, and we do ask that you would have mercy on them as well, and that they might be saved. <clears throat> we thank you that you don't leave us in our sin. We thank you that we get to celebrate Christmas each and every year and celebrate the great lengths that you have taken, knowing that we cannot do anything to save ourselves, to rescue us from our sin. Amen. Thank you.